two real werewolf stories sent in by viewers. Welcome to Scary Stories. This time we've got two different strange witness reports sent in by you guys to us at our scary stories nyc at gmail email address. And thanks for sending those in. We really love to share them here in our videos. The second one is from a person, I'm not sure if they're a man or a woman or what, who wants to run off with the wolves that they think are in actuality werewolves. But this first one is about a truly disturbing and alarming kind of dogman or werewolf habituation problem. And the story submitter tells us that he always knows when the creature is nearby. Because... I smell a werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, My family thinks I'm insane, but I'm too stressed out to even remember what sanity feels like. That doesn't mean the dogman isn't real, or the werewolf, or whatever that thing is. There are evil creatures in this world. You've certainly met an evil man or woman in your life, right? If not, brace yourself, because you will eventually. And if people can turn evil, why not animals? Why not other intelligences? I mean other intelligent creatures because we humans are not the only intelligent beings that exist here on this planet, in this reality. Some of them flit in and out of our world, in my opinion. But I can't prove that, so it's just an opinion. But what is no longer just an opinion to me, is that this werewolf being exists. It's out there. It's evil. And it hates me personally for some reason that I can't explain to you, or to myself. I don't know why the thing hates me, but it does. It can't stand me, and it enjoys frightening me. It knows how scared I am of it, and that makes this thing happy. That's how I know it's evil. When I frighten a creature smaller than myself, I feel bad about it. Don't you? If you scare a kitten or whatever, you get quieter, and you behave in a less frightening way to calm the little fellow down. Well, that's not what this dogman does when he sees that he's gotten you frightened. I swear, the first time my eyes locked with that beast man, I let out a scared whimper. And that dog smiled. Have you ever seen a dog look both angry and happy at the same time? Like he's got his prey in his sights. Well, that was the look this creature gave me. And my body instinctively froze, accepting that it was prey. And that it had already lost the chase before it started. Somehow my brain overruled my frozen body, and I sprinted for the house, slamming the door behind me, and hearing the creature hit the door one second afterward. I had barely gotten inside without being brutally attacked in my own backyard. I called the police, but the creature hid and watched from some vantage point somewhere around here. The police suggested various things I could do to improve security, most of which I couldn't afford to do. This house does have wooden shutters over the windows, though, and I have closed and secured all of those. It makes it darker inside during the day. I have to peek out through slits in the wooden window coverings. But the creature has not tried to get in the house, so I'm hoping that I'm actually secure when I'm in here. I'm the kind of person who waits for sales and then stocks up on large quantities of basic items. I always have food in here to last three months minimum, at all times, and I've recently started investing in survival food packages that I've begun storing in my basement and my attic in case I get cut off from one or the other due to some unexpected crisis. I need to lock myself in the house sometimes for weeks at a time when the beast is outside and messing around in those woods nearby. I can tell when he's around. The air itself smells different. There's a sickly sweet quality to the morning air. 
It smells a bit like a forest fire blowing down from Canada, but more of an animal version of that. The werewolf smells like death, and death is a combination of a lot of foul smells. It's the sickly sweet aftertaste, though. That's the part that tells me that I'm smelling a werewolf in my vicinity. I'm not too great with words, so it's hard for me to describe, but it's a very specific kind of a death odor. It's an ugly thing to live inside of. It's depressing, and it's oppressive. You can't escape it. I tried using air fresheners, but they combine with the werewolf stench and create something even worse. I tried burning incense, but the combination of smoke and death made me physically ill. I can't get that smell to go away until the werewolf decides to move on himself, and I never know when that'll be. Sometimes he's gone by the morning. Other times he's hunkering down somewhere nearby, and I just have to live with it, staying inside where it's safe and waiting the beast man out. It's a pretty terrible way to live. I thought this land was settled. I thought it was owned and run by human beings. But now that I own this house and land, I have to accept that I am not the true owner. I am a squatter on the dogman's land. I am not the alpha here. I am viewed as a nuisance by the true landlord. I am viewed with scorn and derision by this werewolf beast that I live in fear of. How did I become some frightened little squirrel in my own home? What happened to me? Why am I so terrified to the core of that creature? And why does nobody believe me when I tell them what I'm going through? Just about the only people who were nice to me about any of this were the police. And that was because I lied to them and said it was a human prowler. I said it looked like he was wearing a Halloween mask of a werewolf, rather than telling them the real facts. And then I haven't so far called the cops a second time, as I don't see what they could do, and I don't want to become as big a nuisance to them as this werewolf creature has become to me. Sometimes I call it a dogman, but I think that's too kind a term for something as evil as this thing. Calling it a dogman implies that it's an unknown creature, something benign and shy, hiding in the shadows and waiting for science to discover it. One of God's creatures, same as you and me. But I don't think this is a benign natural being. I think this is an evil presence. An escapee from hell. I've been looking things up on the internet while he has me trapped in here. And it seems that canines are the guardians of the underworld in more than one ancient tradition. Why would that be? It's over and over if you look into it. All over the world... People say that the entrance to the underworld, the entrance to the afterlife, is guarded by strange dogs. In Egypt, a dog or actually jackal-headed humanoid god named Anubis was the one who guarded the land of the dead. In Greek mythology, it was Cerberus, a multi-headed dog who prevented the dead from returning to the land of the living. Over and over we see canines in mythology preventing people from coming back from the dead. In a similar way, I am locked in here, prevented from rejoining the world of humans, until the canine-headed entity with that foul odor allows me to leave here and go outside. That evil thing outside. It treats me like I'm already dead. It keeps me locked up in my home as though this were the underworld. I can't live my life being guarded by this Anubis Cerberus man. I can't be alive if I'm being prevented from re-entering the world of the living. But I'm too afraid to go back out there when... I smell werewolf. Story number two. I hear werewolf music. Dear Scary Stories NYC. Listen to them. Children of the Night what music they make. Those famous lines are spoken by Bela Lugosi in the original classic Dracula movie, and he's speaking of the wolves howling outside in the night. Dracula in that film is a wolf, just as he is a bat, and he is a spider, 
waiting to suck your life out of you. He is the leader and master of the wolves and bats and bugs and who knows what else. He's something so far beyond human, and yet he looks just like any other member of the aristocracy. If he was truly once human, he is no more, and he hasn't been human since long before the movie started playing. The Dracula character is too big to fit inside just one avatar. Why be a man all the time, when you can fly like a bat or run like a wolf? Dracula plays the game of life from as many different points of view as pleases him. If you're fascinated with werewolves, well, to Dracula, that's just one possibility for how to pass the evening. Dracula is a werewolf, in addition to being a vampire. He's a shapeshifter. He looks however he wants to look. He inhabits whatever kind of body it amuses him to inhabit in that moment. But because he is in part a werewolf, he hears the howling of the wolves as music. When I first moved to the Cloquet Valley in Minnesota, I found the cries of wolves and other canines in the night to be somewhat unnerving. It sounded like they were warning me of violence, to be honest. It felt like a gang of bullies were outside shouting threats at me, and I felt frightened in my own home. But then one night, I was walking home from picking up my mail, and I was passing through a lot that had become overgrown with trees. Wolves appeared all around me, surrounding me, as if they found me infinitely fascinating. They all looked me in the eye, and I was told never to return the look of a wild animal. Yet they were all staring at me, and as I looked from one to the next, I found myself unable not to make eye contact with each of them. I felt like I was going to have an attack. My heart was beating so fast, and my entire body hurt and stiffened up. But none of the wolves growled or got threatening toward me. Instead, they sort of backed off and parted like the Red Sea. And then I continued home. I knew they were behind me, but I was too afraid of them to look back there. And that night, I dreamed I was one of those silver-colored wolves. And then I was running with them through that same forest. I woke up late the next morning, feeling exhausted my bed covers and pillows all over my room. I say this because I am usually a light sleeper, and I can't remember anything like this happening to me before. When I was a kid, my brother used to toss and turn in his sleep, so I do know what it's like, but it never happened to me personally before. I found myself finding excuses to take that path through that wooded lot more often, hoping to see the wolves a second time. I finally did one morning just a few minutes before dawn, when it was still dark outside. And that was the time when I noticed their eyes shine. It was blue, not yellow or amber as in many werewolf stories I've heard, but it looked very bright blue in the darkness. And that time the pack stayed back away from me, in the tree line, and only the one large silver wolf came out to greet me. I was happy to see him, but still terrified to be in the presence of this large creature. His head came up past my crotch level, and I knew he would have been taller than me if he reared back up on his hind legs. Now isn't that a strange thing to think when you meet a wolf? That he would be taller than you if he stood up like a man. Even as I thought that thought, I figured that was a weird thing to be thinking. But when I made eye contact with that wolf that second time... I could swear he was trying to tell me something with his eyes. It was really compelling. There was such intelligence behind his stare. But what exactly did the creature want me to know? I bent a bit downward to look more closely, and the wolf bolted, as did his entire pack, all at once, like they had one mind controlling them. I turned around and ran home, sort of spooked by the way they all bolted like that. It surprised me and I locked up my place as soon as I got home. That night, I didn't sleep much at all. The wolves were outside, and they were howling again. Only this time when I listened, I could swear I was hearing more than I used to hear. 
Those wolves were actually singing. They were communicating their location and other bits of information, that is true. But they were doing it in the form of improvised vocal music. They were singing along with each other, adding their own additional information to the overall message. But it was truly more like music than anything else in our human world of perception. I guess you could compare it to using Morse code during earlier times in history, because it was information dense. But since emotion is deeply and intensely embedded in everything a wolf has to say, I would compare their way of communication far more to art or poetry or music than I would to a simple, say, telegraph. Morse code or text messages or even emails tend to get to the point as quickly as possible. Wolf howls sort of take their time and tell you something about the one doing the howling. It's because they're more than just messages. They're also laments. And they are also short speeches. They are brief, yet epic, poems. And when a number of canines join together in song, it becomes a free-form jazz improvisation out there in the middle of nature, far from any stage, microphone, or spotlight. The third time I met the wolves, they all gathered around me again like the first time. I let them smell me and I rested my hand on the neck and shoulder of the biggest one, the one who had greeted me the time before. I am not going to say I was afraid of them, but that's because I was terrified of them. Wolves are incredible creatures, and these were all large and well-fed ones. I think impressive is a good word to describe them. These are very impressive beasts, and they walked me toward my home. When we reached my backyard... They looked so sadly at me. It felt like they were inviting me to go walk through the woods with them. To spend the night with them. It was something I couldn't even consider on that night. It was an insane idea. It had frightened me the very thought of it. And I ran into my house and I locked up. It's been 15 days now since that night. More than two weeks. And I have not seen those wolves again. I think about them constantly though. And all of this thinking has caused me to come to a conclusion. If I see those wolves again, and if they invite me to run with them again, I'm going to go. I'm going to take them up on their offer. And I'm going to run with those wolves. Because I don't think they're just wolves. In fact, I am certain they are more than just wolves. And I think you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. If I see them again, and if they invite me to go with them again... I will. But I will try to come back to the human world the next morning. I want to make it back so that I can tell you what happened. But I don't know if that's going to be part of the deal. The music made by these creatures is so intoxicating that I think they must be enchanted animals. Running with them might be like joining a fairy circle. Maybe you'll get back the next morning. Or maybe you'll get back and find 20 years have passed, like with old Rip Van Winkle. I've decided I'm going to go anyway. I'm willing to take the chance to find out. But of course this is all dependent on the wolves deciding to give me another chance. That part is completely out of my hands. And all I can do is wait and see. I still hear them in the late nights though. And that gives me hope because... I hear werewolf music. Hey, if you've enjoyed our recent episodes about the 1936 and the 2008 Dogman Upright Walking Canine cases, both of those stories were taken from the great book Real Wolfmen by the great Linda Godfrey. And you can snag an audiobook version of that for only six bucks if you follow the link in our description. There are a lot more true dogman and real werewolf stories in that book. Written by Linda Godfrey, the original journalist who first exposed the Beast of Bray Road to the world way back in the 1990s. And if you get any version of the book at that link, we get a little bit of remuneration which helps the channel survive. It's a good deal for you and it helps us stay around for one day longer.
I hope that you will all believe us when we tell you that today's EP is Mr. Dedebus. In Asensio Dedebus, that is. Mr. D is a top tier member of our PayPal subscribers club, and as such he gets to see our secret uncensored videos, such as our latest one coming out tonight entitled, I Once Married Into Werewolf Royalty. That's a members only video coming later tonight, Thursday. If you'd like to be as cool as Innocencio the Divas and get to watch that show when it comes out later, then just listen to what this next little guy has to say. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary stories. stories.